So I'm going to introduce James Dean. James is an immersive technology applications engineer on the XR Collaboration Center at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. James has ex experience developing immersive tech for several fields, including computational fluid dynamics research, site feasib feasibility analyses, unmanned underwater operations, and emergency care training and operations. He has extensive expertise with Unity and Unreal Engine, as you're going to see today, um, including GPU and graphic render programming, as well as expertise with utilization of XR hardware. So with that, James, take it away. All right, thank you, Wade. Oh, we even get claps, awesome. That's nice. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, hope you're having some good caffeinated beverages, or if you're not caffeinated, well, you know, something else. Anyway, so this talk is going to cover, uh, introduce what DIS is, it stands for Distributed Interactive Simulations, and um, going to highlight particularly why we're using Unreal Engine with DIS in terms of simulations in this particular case. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce what DIS is. So uh, DIS stands for Distributed Interactive Simulation. Uh, it is a data protocol, not just a simulation network, but a data protocol system um, that allows for human in the loop, uh, world simulations, basically wargaming over networks. It's by design to be transferred over networks. Um, of course, it defines data structures and sets up the protocols and data packets and established by IEEE back in, um, with the standard 1278 for wargaming platform simulation. Uh, developed by DARPA, SimNet, back in the 80s. Uh, it's been in active development ever since. Uh, currently, we're at DIS version 7. Version 8 is going to be coming out in the next couple of months or so. Um, there are numerous types of, or numerous different types of gaming or war gaming simulation protocols. Uh, DIS is one of the like one of the oldest ones and one of the most used ones, um, and it's open source. So there's an implementation you can grab on their GitHub page. Uh, it's open source, you can edit it, it's uh, freely available and implemented for several languages. Now, to get a little bit more into the weeds about what DIS is, um, DIS operates by sending binary data packets called PDUs, uh, protocol data units. There are multiple, numerous types of PDUs that are distributed or sent throughout the network. And uh, to give you kind of an example of what a PDU is, this one is called an entity state PDU. What it does, it updates the state of an active entity that's active inside the scene. And here I have um, basically a binary string of what a PDU is for this entity state PDU. And I've um, expanded upon one particular sub subset of that binary data packet, um, basically what is the entity type. And the entity type is essentially an array of, um, of integers that describe what the actual entity is. So in this particular example, this code array or this binary array, I'm sorry, um, integer array, um, describes that this is a land-based fuel truck that is controlled by the USA and also has like some specific amount of fuel in it, for, for, uh, for example. But it also provides, you know, where is it in the world, where it's the orientation, uh, what is its acceleration, what's its velocity, basically what is its status at this moment in time during the simulation. And so these kind of PDUs are being sent constantly over the network through multiple systems to perform or to uh, run that kind of wargaming simulation that you want to have across multiple networks. So that, we'll take uh, questions at the end if you don't mind. Um, so with that said, um, before I get into why we're using Unreal Engine specifically, let me explain why we're using game engines at all. And fundamentally, game engines are highly interactive user environments that are displaying uh, real-time data sets to you in a streamlined fashion. So with that description in mind, it makes complete sense to utilize game engines to visualize data sets, generate data sets, and to show the user data sets while the simulation is running without kind of overloading the user with too much information. So game engines are uniquely suited for data visualizations and data generations. Um, they, can be genera they can be used for synthetic generations, for learning algorithms, or uh, machine learning capabilities. They have a bunch of utility that is not just for games. Now, that said, um, there's also a continuous stream of improvements and milestones and new features that are coming out with game engines, particularly with Unity and Unreal, um, which if you sat in me and Wade's talk uh, from yesterday morning, you'll <laughs> you'll have an idea of just how far things have gotten. Um, that said, I have a couple examples here where uh, I took a digital, I created a digital twin of Central Spark, as well as created a digital twin of the Naval Submarine Base Kings Bay that's down in Georgia, I believe. So these are tool sets and capabilities that you can do in a game engine for synthetic data generation. Now, 
Why Unreal Engine specifically? Well, first off, to kind of link DIS with the Unreal Game Engine, or the Unreal Engine, uh, AFRL's Gaming Research Integration for Learning Lab had created and implemented a plugin for, uh, for Unreal Engine, as well as for Unity, that makes it trivial to integrate DIS into your programs for Unreal Engine or Unity. Now, granted, that's not specific to Unreal Engine, but it's trivial enough that you can actually go to the asset store, to the marketplace store, grab this, put it into your project, and you are integrated with DIS. It's really easy to do. Um, and they also provide example codes, example uh, documentations, example projects to get you started right away. So to get more into the weeds of specifically why Unreal Engine, um, first off, Unreal Engine's source code is open source. It is C++ based which means that if you have any external libraries, if you have any external applications that you have developed or libraries or DLLs that are C++ based, this is just a C++ project. And you can do your own standard workflows to compile external stuff or modify the source code as you see fit. Um, in addition to that, if you don't want to do any coding at all, you don't have to. Um, the Unreal Engine Editor, which itself is not open source, uh, allows you to do coding through their blueprint uh, visual coding system. And in fact, uh, Unreal Engine in particular is unique in that they suggest you do both uh, and enable you to write C++ code to integrate with the blueprint system such that you can integrate both and uh, combine the power of both. And that makes it relatively easy to work with teams who may not be comfortable doing text coding but may be comfortable doing visual coding. Uh, at least if they understand logic, they should not have any, really any problems being productive in terms of implementing new features or behaviors through these systems. Um, and it's actually quite powerful. Uh, besides that, um, the biggest feature that is super helpful with DIS is the large world coordinate systems. This is unique to, this is in beta in Unreal Engine 5.0. It's out in uh, commercial, or commercially available. Well, I should say commercially available. It's available in 5.1 and in 5.2. Uh, what the large world coordinate system does is it changes the, uh, the fundamental values of floating point values that are used to compute the transforms of objects in the scene to double precision floating point values. And there is no performance loss in this particular case which means that now we can render very, 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 very large spaces without having to worry about doing numerical manipulations or visual manipulations to kind of fake that we're traveling across the world. So here, um, I think I mentioned that you can, uh, you can create up to an 88 million square kilometer landscape, which effectively means you can have a space that's larger than the actual world in world uh, coordinate systems without having to do any sort of computational wizardry. Um, on top of that, and because of that, um, there are GIS specific applications. This one in particular is looking at Cesium, um, where you basically, they basically give you a WGS84 accurate representation of the globe. So that in conjunction with DIS gives you a really robust system for wargaming and platforming. Other features. This one is again unique to Unreal Engine 5. Uh, this is called the Nanite system. What it effectively is, is a complex level of detail binning system. And what this does is if you have a really complex CAD model or really complex polygon or multiple complex models that you want to import into the scene, traditionally you'd have to worry about decimating the model or making sure its uh, polygon count is low enough that you're not worried about optimizations or rendering performance. And what the Nanite system does is says, if you pay an upfront cost to allow Unreal Engine to do the binning and sorting upfront, you are no longer limited by the amount of polygons or primitives that create the CAD model. That means that you are no longer limited by the complexity of the model you want to represent. So in this video here, um, I've imported what, what I call a UE stress ball. The stress ball itself has about 6 million triangles. And um, once I pay that little upfront cost, I then clone it. And at this point in time in this video, I am currently at a total of 65 million triangles being rendered at once with no performance loss. This is a major feature that is unique only to Unreal Engine 5.1 and 5.2. Okay? So we're no longer worried about the complexity of CAD models. Granted, you still have to pay the upfront cost. So if, if, you, if you have problems with doing that, then you have to figure out some other solution. Uh, beyond that, Another thing that's nice with Unreal Engine is the ability to grab 
uh, various texture buffers in real time uh, in their material processing capabilities. Uh, so you can create what's called a post-processing material, which adds the end stage effect to the screen that allows you to manipulate and create new and interesting dynamic um, uh, visualizations. And in this example here, uh, I'm grabbing various physics-based material properties from the, serv or from the materials of objects in the scene, such as the metallic, how rough is it, um, how, how reflective is the surface, and I'm combining them and manipulating them to effectively create a new visualization. What this means is that if you have sensors that you want to represent or you want to emulate in some form, this is the way you should do it. So here, uh, I'm combining all of these data sets um, from those four images into this one image to get a representation of a nominal sensor. And this is all using the physics space material modeling systems capable in Unreal Engine. Now, there are some caveats to this. Unreal Engine is big, it's beefy, it's powerful, and with great power becomes great responsibility. And I, mean, I seriously mean that. Um, there is so many features and so many layers to this system that you really need to have a team of specialists who understand their specific area criteria such that they are capable in working together with the team without stepping on each other's toes. Um, if you have a team of generalized developers or generalized you know, jack-of-all-trades people, it's, you have to be very, very careful on organizing the roles and responsibilities that each team member has so that they don't cross over each other. They don't run into things like um, uh, software, uh, like version control problems or merge, you know, merge issues if you're using Git, uh, GitHub or any sort of Git repository. And each component of Unreal Engine that has its own powerful system has a very steep learning curve. You have to invest the time to learn this stuff uh, depending on which avenue you want to learn about and that can take a lot of time and investment. So be aware that if you want to get started in Unreal Engine, um, you will be spending a lot of time simply learning how to do things before you can become productive in doing the thing. Because it's C++ and the engine, it's, uh, the engine code itself is ext extensively complex, if you're not following a fairly strict um, form or style of coding standards, you may fall into the technical debt problem where the technical debt increases over and over in time, and then you find a bug, and you have to pay that technical debt, which can take you a lot of time to recover from. Um, so, recommendation from my personal standpoint is, if you're going to be developing on a C++ side from Unreal Engine, follow, a coding, follow strictly a coding guideline, for sure. Um, and as I mentioned before, like, Unreal Engine is not tailored for a small team of generalists, it's tailored towards a large team of specialists. And uh, I wanted to mention that your typically desired format of teams here is like you want to have one or two C++ developers that do the back end. Um, you want to have a, one or two Blueprint developers that takes the C++ code from C++ developers to utilize that. And then you, on top of that, you want to have a couple of technical artists and level designers to, to build the top layer of this. And you don't want them doing each other's jobs. So I really sped past this. So are there any questions? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, are you seeing a consistency in DOD about, there's, there's, besides DIS, there's HLL? Yep. Are you seeing consistency, or are they, they, have they chosen one to use at this point? No, um, there's no, there's no one true way that I'm aware of, um, because, partly because um, both DOD and the teams that are using DIS want to be agnostic of the platform that's being used. Yeah, I'm working with Marines and right now on a project, and they're standing up a, a lab to do this mm -hmm. down in Orlando, and they're still figuring out which way they're going to go. We're building something in Unreal, and it seems like the IS would be our choice mm -hmm. to go with for Unreal. So uh, we can push as much as we can yeah. to help them in that decision. Yeah. Uh, I will also say that um, we have been looking for other plugins for HLA or other wargaming platform systems. We have not found one that's open source or just quickly available. Is that specific to DIS in Unity as well? I mean, it, we, Unity has plugins for it as well. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That'll help with the acceptance. Yeah. 
Um, David, did you have a question? Um, when you were showing the PDUs, the packets, yeah. um, you said like it was an array of integers, but I think you, have, you also have the positional vector in there, right? Mm -hmm. like, so this is a combination of all those things. Like, I thought this was interesting because, and so well, I have a related question, I guess. Like, you yeah. know, in um, Apex, I think they're talking about like a multiplayer implementation custom, and, but it seems like this, and I wasn't familiar with DIS before, but like, it seems like that's what this is designed for. Here's all the binary packages we need to pass, follow the standard, and you can have this distributed environment of players who are all in an interactive simulation. Like, do you know, like, is there, why is an Apex using this? Or like, it's not clear to me where sure. the scope of the yeah. Um, well, to give it like a bit of background, like DIS has been around for forever, yeah. and but the context of DIS is specifically towards wargaming. So the Apex work is not specific towards wargaming, it's specific towards like engineering design and development. So you don't need to have a PDU called a collision or a data or a detonator PDU inside of Apex because I don't think anything can detonate inside of that system, <laughs> right? Because I think a lot of what they do is like two players in the scene, you want to know each other's position to be able to see yeah. each other. And I'm not sure if I see a PDU for that of like, hey, where's the player position? Uh, well, you get that through the entity state PDU. That gives the location and orientation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? No? All right. If you have any other questions, I'll be sitting around with a yellow lanyard. Uh, feel free to ask me, stop by, and ask me more questions if you want. But otherwise, thank you very much.